Hello and welcome to the David Carrier Show. I'm David Carrier, your family's personal attorney, and this is the Mother's Day edition of the David Carrier Show, which means that uh, if you're a mother, if you have a mother, if you would like to be a mother, if, um, um, very excited if you have one, uh, if you like mothers, uh, then your, your call is free. Uh, and that means that you can call us at 774-2424, absolutely free of charge. You do not have to put the nickels in the radio as usual. Instead, today, um, you can go ahead, buy your flowers for your mom if she's still around, which my mom's not, sadly. Uh, but I do know several other mothers, and they'll be getting the flowers. Um, but uh, 774-2424, that's area code 616-774-2424, which is not long distance from anywhere now that there is no more long distance. Right? No, you remember that? Toll-free calls? 800 numbers were a big deal because they were toll free. Well, who pays for long distance now anyway? I'm not aware, unless it's a different country and even then. So there you are. Uh, this, <laughs> why would you call us anyway? If it's Mother's Day and you're busy getting mom breakfast in bed, you know, all those, all those wonderful things, huh? Hmm? Why would you call us? Well, if you have any question, comment, or concern regarding wills, trusts, or probate, if you're wondering how do I beat the high cost of long-term care, uh, how do I make sure that my stuff actually gets to the kids? Uh, little whippersnappers. Uh, there was a mother involved somewhere, so now there are little whippersnappers. And we want to make sure that the stuff gets there, uh, if you care that it gets there. And, well, avoiding probate, all that kind of thing, very important. Uh, if you have a question about real estate or business law, again, 774-2424, area code 616-616-774. 24, 24. If we could make it easier, we would. Of course, we do like to get the emails. Emails always uh, very welcome. David at davidcarrierlaw.com. Uh, and if you just go on over to the website, oh my goodness, what a cornucopia of uh, confounding conciseness. I don't know. Anyway, there's lots of stuff on the website, uh, davidcarrierlaw.com. And, of course, we want you to come to the uh, weekly workshops. These are workshops we do all the time, all at the various different offices, whether it's in Holland, uh, up in uh, Norton Shores, down in Portage, uh, or at the Mothership, of course, in Grand Rapids, Michigan. That's where, we, uh, that's where we do all that stuff, yeah. And you are more than welcome. We'd love to see you uh, at a workshop. It's a good way to get the ball started, get your questions answered. We are still doing them uh, online, so if you'd like to do it online, that's great. But we are with the uh, oatmeal raisin cookies and everything else, just like uh, just like before, only better. So, uh, what are we uh, what are we looking at today? Today, Mother's Day on 20, 2022. Uh, challenges to the rule of law, right? You know, we're going after the judges now, I guess, trying to intimidate uh, Supreme Court justices, leaking stuff out of. The- <laughs> the Supreme Court. Oh my goodness, what a uh, you know. You wonder is there where can you where can you go for um, you know just some common sense, sanity, etc. I mean, besides here, I hear obviously. Well, yes, of course, but uh, you know we've got. A, let's see what what do we what do we have going on these days? What are the challenges facing? Uh, <laughs> what are the challenges facing senior America? Senior, you know, people like you, you know, I was reflecting on this yesterday. It's, um, uh, it's kind of different, right? I mean, if you think about your parents and, um, uh, they grew up in the depression, right? I mean, by the time the depression was over, my dad was 15, 16 years old by the time the war started, right? Uh, this is the second world war I'm talking about. And he had grown up in the depression, which gave him a certain set of habits, attitudes, ways of thinking about things and those were deeply impressed on myself and my siblings which no doubt they were impressed deeply on on you and your brothers and sisters uh to the extent that you had brothers and sisters and those are the things we carried with us through the 60s right and 70s and 80s and 90s and these are the things that kind of informed the way we think about things like the supreme court so there's a there's a reservoir of I don't know, sanctity is the right word or something, but th- there's a reservoir of respect, of consideration, something, I don't know exactly, for um, some institutions of government. And, uh, you know, th- maybe that was the last one to 
um, to be devalued or what have you. Uh, but it comes from that, that history that, hey, you know, things could get bad here. Things have been bad here. You know, it wasn't always the land flowing with milk and honey where you can poop on the sidewalk and get your drugs for free. It wasn't always like that, you know. People actually had to work. There were people who were actually hungry because they couldn't find anything to do. They couldn't find any jobs. You know, Grapes of Wrath wasn't a fictionary tale. I mean, people actually did that stuff. The Okies went to, you know, Okie from Muskogee. They went to California looking for work. I mean, that stuff really happened, which is not a shared experience. I, I, I wasn't there for it, uh, but my folks were, and it influenced them, influenced me. And, and then we got to, the, to the, the 60s and whatnot and 70s and all the rest. And nowadays, of course, where every desire, you only have to think of it for it to be satisfied. Uh, and now, hey, guess what? Um, you know, it was that, uh, that line, you know, history calls and, called and wants its foreign policy back, right? You remember that? History called, you know, you're worried about Russia and you shouldn't be because, you know, that's the 70s call, right? And watch it. Whoa, 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 wait a second. Uh, that guy is now blowing people up, right? <laughs> I mean, killing people, like lots of people, like breaking stuff, like terrible stuff going on. And, you know, if you wonder how did World War I get started with the murder of Archduke Ferdinand in Serbia, right? Well, people started mobilizing, and one thing led to another, led to another, led to another. Look around you. What do you see? What do you, what are you seeing? Um, if it's not mobilization, if it's not, you know, oh, we're going to give weapons to these guys. Yeah, what does that mean? That means we've got to replace those weapons. What does that mean? That means we've got to get the arms factories going again. I mean, like overtime. What does that mean? It means we also need our own people to be able to fire these weapons. That, you, you know what I mean? Evil doesn't go away because you wish it would. Right? I mean, there's bad people out there who want to kill other people and take their stuff. Um, Russians, for example. They, they really, they're really real. And, you know, obviously there was, you know, this country was all twisted up in an act of fiction politically motivated which is very obvious to everybody now i mean the evidence is the evidence was always there but now it's in court right where uh that was just a bunch of nonsense uh, but now we get the russian but this is real i mean this is on video you know russians killing people and getting killed back and there we here we are again on mother's day in 2022 and you know you got people who say there's no such thing as a woman who want to protest women's rights now Oh, wait a second. I thought there wasn't any women. Can't tell what they are. <laughs> well, now we're going to, I don't know. It's just a ball of confusion. I mean, what's, you know, how do you, how do you sort all this stuff out? And, and frankly, gets a little, uh, I'm sure as, uh, as for you, for you as for me, it gets a little, uh, you know, it's what happens when there's too much birthday cake at the party. It happens when things are too good. It's what happens when people, uh, instead of an attitude of gratitude, it's an attitude of entitlement. It's an attitude of mind first. It's an attitude of uh, I don't have to contribute here. Whatever makes me angry is therefore justified because I'm angry. It's the it's the rationale of the infant, right? If I'm hungry, I get to scream and kick. Well, you tell me there's something else going on. I mean, every everything that makes certain people angry, they seem to think that they're entitled to burn the place down. Am I wrong about that? I mean, is there is there any higher function going on with some of these folks? I mean, and they literally burn things down, right? You know, I don't know how many people who went in January 6th, right? I don't know how many of those people uh, were of this ilk. I don't know. Uh, but you've got one event, January 6th, where it looks like there were, there were people, you know, got all riled up and, and decided to do that, right? Um what about the rest of us who kind of felt that way? Maybe. <clears throat> you know, what about the rest of you who felt that way? Well, you didn't go doing that stuff. But there does seem to be, doesn't there seem to? I don't know. I mean, when you look around, it's like, <clears throat> hey, uh, we're going to see if we can intimidate some Supreme Court justices. We're going to go yell and scream at their, in their driveways. Okay. I guess that's okay. Right? Nobody cares about that. And we're going to do this. We're going to do that. Whatever. Um, and that's actually kind of a step down from the 
you know, the mostly peaceful protests that we've seen over the last few years. So where, where does it all end? The answer is, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, but in my own little corner of the world, my own little niche here, is making sure that folks who work, folks like you, um, don't get the short end of the stick. That's, you know, it's a little thing. It's not a, it's not a major monumental thing, but it does seem to me that it's middle class folks, folks like you, people who go to work, people who save, people who pay things off. You know, people have a reason to expect that the dollars that you earn will continue to have some value. You know, that inflation won't eat everything up. People who didn't get by asking the government for a handout. Right? Seems to me that making sure that people like you are not impoverished by long-term care is an important thing. It, it, you know, you paid the money in. I mean, the most amazing thing to me is that the doctors and lawyers, people with advanced degrees and stuff, are the ones who are screaming the loudest. The people who are benefiting the most from their highfalutin education, which they signed on for, are the ones who want you to pay for it. Right? They borrowed the money. It was a loan. It wasn't a scholarship. It wasn't a grant. Huh? What did they say now? They didn't know the difference? Is that it? Where, 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 where does that, you know, where's that whole student loan? Uh, you should pay it off because, you know, I think you should. Or, I, I don't even understand where that comes from. Why should a truck driver pay off a lawyer's law school bills? Why? Does it make sense to you? Doesn't make sense to me. And yet that's exactly what's going on. Right? There's techniques that we use to preserve IRAs, for example, to prevent extremely high rates of taxation which is sort of the natural course, and I can explain that to you. It's not, it's not legally mandated, but it is the natural course what happens with IRAs after you're gone, right? To lose 40% of it, 50% of it in other states. Around here, it's you know, 30, 40% is what you lose to taxes. It doesn't have to be that way. It doesn't have to, right? And it's not mandated. It's not absolute law, right? It just kind of works out that way. There's an awful lot of things that just kind of work out that way uh, that have to do with folks like you, people who've worked, people who saved, right, getting the short end of the stick. I'm, I'm freaking sick of it. It isn't, you know, that's what this has been about for the last 32 years, and it just seems to me that as we go on here, right, as we continue on with the overwhelming entitlement, right, th that it's like, oh, I don't want to put things to a vote. Uh, it's my right um, about everything from the right to poop in the street to the right to steal stuff out of stores, to the right to do whatever and have somebody else pay for it. You know, if you pay for it. And, the, of course, nowadays the very notion of paying for things seems to be, you know, unpopular. I don't get that part either. Give me a call, why don't you? 616-774-2424. We'll get your question, comment, or concern on the air. I'm David Carrier. You're listening to The David Carrier Show. Welcome back to The David Carrier Show. I'm David Carrier. Your family's personal attorney. You know, uh, I asked uh, I asked my producer if we could get some Glenn Miller, you know, like in the mood, that kind of, you know, the big band kind of thing. And I think what he heard was Steve Miller, which uh, which I don't want him to change because I, uh, you know, big Steve Miller fa Miller fan. You know, back in the uh, back in high school, uh, you may recall he did uh, he did some of the amazing that like quadraphonics and stuff like that. Uh, do you remember that? Who raise your hand if you remember? When they had uh, quadraphonic stereo, they 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 figured out a way to put four channels on a vinyl disc, and a buddy of mine had a quadraphonic setup, and to listen to the you know uh, Edgar Winter Group was another one that that really took advantage of that uh, of that format, and you know he had the four speakers, a big amp, you know, so you're sitting in his bedroom, and, you know, <laughs> the music is just going all the way around. Uh, well, that you know that's what we did in the. Uh, in the early 70s, you know, right? 74, 75, um, back in the day. So anyway, keep up with the uh, Steve Miller. And next uh, next hour, I promise the bumper music will be Glenn Miller. Um, but uh, but we do like Steve Miller. I'm not uh, I'm not arguing with it. Okay. Uh, welcome back to the David Carrier Show, 616-774-2424. That's the number to call if you'd like to get your question, comment, or concern uh, on the air. 774-2424, area code 616. You know, we got a, uh, uh, there was an email I saw, question I saw, that was um, 
in fact, I wrote about it in the um, in the uh, newspaper this weekend. So if you get the uh, any of the any of the uh, M Live new or Gannett papers or Hearst papers or whatever, it's uh, it's in there. The Michigan Elder Law Elder Law Reporter, and um, the key is it's it's one of those questions that that does come up frequently um, because people are trying to do stuff yeah which is pretty vague right what they're trying to do is um, use deeds deeds to protect disabled kids you know to make sure that things go along okay um, and it just shows you the fact pattern it just shows you what happens with the blunt force of those things okay so let me let me give you the facts disabled brother has a legal guardian. Now, what that means, who's also a family member, uh, which means that they've been to probate court. In other words, a uh, disabled brother might be developmentally disabled, okay, always disabled, that could happen, or it doesn't say that, the, the nature of the disability doesn't isn't here, they, they don't tell us, um, but it could be developmentally disabled, he could have had a car accident, could be just dementia, who knows, uh, but in any event, there was no planning done and maybe it was not possible to do any planning. That's in, that happens, right? Um, to do any planning, but uh, but anyway, we've got a guardian now uh, who makes the uh, healthcare decisions, makes the living decisions for the disabled sibling, for the disabled brother, uh, and will not return to the family home, uh, which he has a life estate in, and is also in an irrevocable trust. Which kind of makes you wonder what is going on here. Uh, with what is up with that irrevocable trust. Now, this is not at all unusual. Let's say mom and dad have been caring for brother, whether it was a developmental disability, whether it was an accidental disability, you know, got into a car accident or something, or dementia or what have you. Okay, not at all unusual for parents to care for adult children at home, right, because they don't want to see them in a group home. They don't want to see them in a long-term care facility. They'll care for the, for the child at home. And to make sure that the child always has a place to live, they will give that disabled child a life estate in the home, okay? This is like one of the worst mistakes you can make, but people do it all the time. Attorneys tell people to do this. This is the, you know, that, I don't know if you've ever picked up on this, but one of the most frustrating things to me is the way that people who should know better are telling folks to do things which, which really, you know, if you've been hanging around the, you know, you, you hang around the bar for a few, you, you pick up on the gossip, right? Well, you hang around th this bar, you know, the elder law bar. See see how it was made that, you know, the hang around the bar, you pick up the gossip. You hang around the elder law bar, you figure out some of these things just don't work, right? But everybody, I guess everybody says they do. So um, so anyway, you, you do this deed that puts the kid on, and then you say, oh, well, now the kid always has a place to live, which is not true. It's not true. Yes, the kid has an ownership interest in the thing. That's true. Uh, did you provide for the kid to pay the taxes on the thing? Oh, forgot about that. How about the utilities? Whoops. How about insurance? Uh, no, we didn't do that either. Okay. You know, it's, the, it, it's, it's a piece of the pie. I'm not saying it isn't. But it's a poor way, a poor way to solve for that. Even that piece of the pie, it's a bad way to do it. And I'll get into that, right? But it doesn't solve the problem. It doesn't solve the problem because it's not giving the kid a place to live. It's giving the kid an ownership interest, right, in the ability to live there without providing for everything else that has to happen in order for that to be reality. So there are many remainder men. It's a large family, okay? I'm from a family of eight. So if one of my brothers and sisters, yeah, I can imagine this, right? And they are all in agreement to sell the family home including the disabled brother's guardian. So now he's in a nursing home. Did I mention that? Uh, he's now in a nursing home, will not return to the family home, will not return. Okay, now they want to sell it because we've got one of the kids willing to step up. Another family member, remainderman, wants to buy us out and move into the home, hoping that we can all just sign off on the house slash trust. What's going on with that again? And quick claim the property to her. Okay, so big sis wants to move in the house, right? Because no one's living there now, right? Who's paying the taxes? Who's paying the utilities? How's all that happening? Who's taking care of the place, right? I mean, these are real. These are the questions that come up 
in a situation like that, and there's no answers for it. Well, sister says, hey, I'll solve the problem. I'll move in. I'll buy everybody else out, okay? And uh, and then we'll be good. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, hoping we could all sign off, quick claim the property to her. Not sure, the question, not sure if this is allowable or advisable. We also have uh, concerns about potential Medicaid recovery if the life estate is terminated while the life estate holder is still alive. Ah, somebody's been doing a little research here, right? Somebody's like, oh, wait a second. What if we give up, what if disabled brother gives up that life estate? Well, guess what? There's a value to the ability to live in property. That's what a life estate is. And that music means that <clears throat> we'll finish this up when we get back from the news. You're listening to the David Carrier Show. I'm David Carrier, your family's personal attorney. Welcome back to the David Carrier Show. I'm David Carrier. Uh, I am not the pompatus of love. No, sorry. Just the pompatus of uh, elder law. That's right. Uh, 616-774-2424. That's the number for you to call if you'd like to get your question, comment, or concern uh, on the air. And uh, that would be what? Uh, estate planning, wills, trust, probate. That would be elder law. How do I not go broke in long-term care? Is nursing home the only thing you got for me because I'd rather stay at home? Which, frankly, who wouldn't? And we got you covered there, too. Uh, also, if you have a uh, question about uh, real estate or business law. So it's Mother's Day. That means it's free if you have a mother um, or you like mothers in general, or you're not totally opposed to motherhood. Um, not to be confused with Robin Hood. But anyway, if, uh, if any of that stuff applies to you, then your phone call will be free. We will not charge you. And you can call us at 616-774-2424. Uh, we're dealing with a, an issue that came up where uh, we've got disabled brother has a legal guardian, meaning uh, he didn't have any planning in place. And uh, there's a court-appointed guardian. That's what guardian means, court-appointed, probate court-appointed person uh, to make living decisions for this person. Now, uh, again, we don't have the details in the background, not really necessary. Uh, this person is now in the nursing home, nursing home in a long-term care, skilled nursing facility, long-term care facility, uh, sometimes called a SNF, S-N-F, right? SNF, skilled nursing facility. Now you know the lingo. Say, oh, I don't want my mom to go to a sniff. Right. And then everyone will know what you're talking about. Uh, so anyway, disabled brother's now in a nursing home, but he has a life estate in the family home. This is extremely common. People do this all the time, right? It's a mistake. You shouldn't do it like this. If you're going to take the time, if you're worried about somebody's living arrangements, right, then why not do it correctly? Why take the easy way out? Why take the, you know, and, and, and here's the thing. I'm saying all this, and at the same time, I'm very conscious that this is exactly what people are told to do, all right? So I'm not unsympathetic to the fact that, hey, they told us to do this. Paid the guy a bunch of money, you know, had a lawyer on the door, and uh, so I did what they told me to do. I get it. It's unfortunate, but it's also accurate that this is, not unusual legal advice. It's terrible legal advice, but it's not unusual, as will be demonstrated as we go through. So the idea, why would you give a disabled child a life estate? Because you wanted a roof over their head. That's why you would do it, okay? Well, there's good ways and bad ways of doing it. This is like the worst way, because now brother is in a long-term care facility. Perhaps mom and dad have died. That would be a, a pretty good inference here because they don't, they're not mentioned. And now all the remainder men, in other words, all the siblings now own the home, okay? So brother gets the home as long as he's alive, and then when he dies, then it goes to brothers and sisters. Okay, that's how this is set up. And now because he's in the nursing home, everyone's like, what the hell are we going to do with the, with the house? Who wants to pay for it? Nobody wants to pay for it. Brother's in a nursing home, probably on Medicaid, probably, although they could have screwed that up too, and maybe it's being paid for from mom and dad's money. I don't know. All right? they, didn't, they didn't mention it, although there is a concern about potential Medicaid recovery. So yeah, then maybe he's on Medicaid by now. Okay, that, But like I say, you never want to uh, underestimate the ability of people to, uh, and by people I mean lawyers, to mess things up. So 
Let's assume he's on Medicaid. Anyway, now Big Sis wants to move in the house. Uh, she wants to buy everybody else out. And the question is, how do we make that happen? And the answer is, because you did the life estate, right, it's probably a bad idea to do it at this point. So here's the thing. If you sell the house, and it, we're talking here about, uh, quote, we also have concerns about potential Medicaid recovery if the life estate is terminated while the life estate holder is still alive. We well, see you can't just terminate a life estate. You can't just terminate it, okay? It's, a, it's like having an ownership interest in land. It is an ownership interest in land, okay? It's worth something. What's it worth? Well, the good news is the state of Michigan has published a whole table in Bridges Eligibility Manual 400 in the back, all right? There's a life estate and life estate factor table, life lease factor table, table two, exhibit two, um, table saying at various ages just how much a life estate is worth. Now, remember, what is a life estate? A life estate is your right to occupy property for the rest of your life, okay? So when you're just born, all right, there's a life expectancy. As you get older, all right, there's different life expectancies. Generally, they get shorter. Interestingly, for the first, get this, um, I just noticed this when I was researching this question. Uh, for the first couple of years of life, because there's a infant mortality sort of thing going, there's a bump for infant mortality, actually the life estate is worth less. By the time you get to age two or three, it's worth more than at birth. Ha, huh, who knew? I hadn't noticed that before. Anyway, the idea is the older you get, the fewer years you have to live in the place, the less the life estate is worth. Does that make sense? So if you're like 70 years old, let's, and that was the number I looked up for the newspaper article. If you're like 70 years old, your life estate is still worth uh, like 65% of the value of the property, all right? Now, I'm, you were promised there'd be no math, I get it. But the idea here is that if you're 65, uh, 70, I think was the number, if you're 70 years old, how much is the right to occupy that property worth for the rest of your life? You get to live in it for the rest of your life. What is that worth? According to the state of Michigan, it's worth about 65% of the value of the property. In other words, if it's a $100,000 house, your right to live in it is worth $65,000. So what about all your brothers and sisters? What is their right to get the leftovers worth? The answer is $35,000. Are you with me on this? Does this make sense? You say, but wait a second. Brothers, uh, he's not doing well. He's in the nursing home. He doesn't have X number of years like it says on the table and blah, blah, blah. Doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is what's his date of birth, what his birth certificate say, and and does he have a life estate? And what's the value of the property? So you go out, you find the value of the property, you multiply it times the table, and then if you sell the property like you want to do here, you want to sell the property to Big Sis, right? She wants to buy it. Well, you've got to pay brother that life estate factor, 65%, times whatever, you know, the value. And it's got to be fair market value. Otherwise, they're coming after you. Who, who's coming after you? Medicaid's coming after you. So you have to sell it for fair market value. You have to give brother the money reflecting the life estate. Because if you don't, then the, it won't be Medicaid recovery exactly. Medicaid will say, hey, you've got to, see, he can have the homestead. Homestead is okay. He can have that. And when he dies, the homestead, poof, vanishes. And now the other brothers and sisters own the whole thing. That's what the bonehead attorney who set this up, or whoever was set it up. Um, <laughs> you're not a bonehead if you did it. I mean, it's not your fault, right? I mean, you researched it, I'm sure, very well online. You got a YouTube video that says this is the way to go. Hey, who am I to judge? Uh, but if it was an attorney, then we can hold the attorney to a higher standard, right? Please. And uh, I'll call that person a bonehead. So if they're the one who set this up, you know, with no consideration, with no judgment, with no nothing but a mechanical ignorance of the, all the ramifications of it, 
Well, I, I think I'm justified in calling that person a bonehead. And I'm not making a general, uh, casting general aspersions on lawyers in general. I got to be careful not to, not to disparage the profession or whatever. But anyway, I'm not. It's just this thing, this way of doing things is really ill-advised. And like I say, it's, um, it's almost routine. It's, it's sad that it is routine, but there it is. Anyway, point being, you've got to pay brother off. You got to pay brother is 65%. What if it's 200,000? Now you got to give him 130,000. Oh, happy day. But if you wait till he dies, right? Then his life estate, poof, vanishes, right? And it goes to the other kids, right? So why would we sell the property? We wouldn't. We wouldn't sell the property. That would be the bad thing because you can't just terminate the life estate. A lot of people, a lot of people get caught in this all the time because now the, the whole register of deeds, I don't know if you're aware of this, the whole register of deeds thing, that's all uh, computerized. They can do a full text search across the state, find out who owns what, right? Them discovering that you did this kind of thing is not a hit and miss, oh, I self-reported. It's not like that anymore. <laughs> when you go through asset detection, you go through asset detection, all right? I mean, they're going to find it, okay? So you're not, you know, people who skated, oh, oh, this worked, yeah, and that's the other thing here. Oh, this worked out in the past. Always worked out in the past. Hey, welcome to today. Things that used to work don't work anymore. And part of it is better enforcement. Part of it is just uh, more of awareness of, of what the rules are. And part of it is they change the rules. I mean, you gotta, you gotta be alive to all of those different things happening. So this is like, uh, you can't just buy the house. What you can do is what we'll get into when we get back from the, uh, back from the break. But, you know, this stuff is not simple. It's not easy. If someone's telling you that, they're trying to sell you something. Don't buy it. Don't buy it. At least give me a call, 616-774-2424. I am the pompatus of elder law. <laughs> and you're listening to the David Carrier Show. I'm David Carrier, your family's personal. Attorney. Welcome back to the David Carrier Show. I'm David Carrier, your family's, as you know, your family's personal attorney. Now, we are talking about a situation where uh, we've got mom and dad set up a uh, life estate for their disabled child. Okay, we don't know how they got disabled, doesn't really matter. But there was a court appointed guardian which tells us that there was no, uh, no plan in place, you know, prior to for the uh, for the child. So maybe they're developmentally disabled. Uh, maybe they just didn't plan. Maybe it was dementia. Maybe it was a car accident. Who knows? Uh, but we've got someone who's disabled and uh, has a court-appointed guardian at this point. And now what they want to do is they want to, now he's in a nursing home, skilled nursing facility, full-time. And the question is, uh, and sis wants to buy, big sis wants to buy the house, uh, pay fair market value, of course, which you absolutely have to do. You know, no bargain sales here. And uh, uh, pay off the brother. Uh, at age 70, and I looked this up during the break, at age 70, the life estate interest is worth 60% of the purchase price, okay? So you've got to give, if you sell the house, if big sis buys the house while brother is alive, disabled brother is alive, then 60% of the money has to go to disabled brother, which of course is going to whack him off his Medicaid. Boom, now he's gone from the Medicaid until the money's all gone. Does that sound like a good idea? Oh, and by the way, the remainder men, all the rest of the kids, and it's a large family according to, the, uh, according to our email here, um, the rest of the kids get to split 40%. <clears throat> I can't imagine that would be very popular. So what are we going to do? Now, there's a real problem here. Because this was done so poorly, there's a real problem. All right? And the real problem is I got a house out there and taxes are owed on the house. Somebody's got to pay the annual property taxes. Somebody's got to paint it from time to time. Somebody's got to keep the, um, you know, the, uh, uh, the heat and the air conditioning, if there's air conditioning, keep the heat going at least so the pipes don't freeze, right? Somebody's got to take care of the dang thing so black mold doesn't take over and now it's terrible. Okay, so how is that all going to happen? Because if we sell the thing while brother is alive, while brother is alive, then... Two things happen. Number one, he's got cash, which knocks him off the Medicaid until the cash is all spent, uh, spent down, right? Which is, again, another 
very unfortunate thing that usually happens. People go through this Medicaid spend down and everybody tells you to do it. I understand that doesn't make it right. Okay. It doesn't make it the good thing for your family that everyone's telling you to do it, but they do tell you to do it. So I acknowledge that reality. It's unfortunate reality, but it's reality. So, okay. So that's what happens to the 60% that goes to brother. And that's based on his age, not his life expectancy, his age. All right, are we, are we clear about this? Because people all the time, oh, well, he's doing horrible. You know, he, you know, doctors say he's got three weeks to live or whatever. It doesn't matter. What matters is what does the table say, right? What does the published numbers say that the, that the government has put out, okay? So it's not based on life expectancy, based on age, age-based life expectancy. <laughs> but anyway, you, you get what I'm saying. So how do we avoid this? We wait till brother dies. When brother dies, then poof, his life estate evaporates. All the money now goes to uh, the remainder, the remainder men. So how do we make this happen? Well, somebody, like I say, somebody's got to pay all these taxes, utilities, upkeep, blah, blah, blah. Somebody's got to do that. Who's that going to be? Oh, oh, by the way, you can't sell the house without court approval anyway. So you're going back to probate court saying, hey, judge, pretty please. You know, it's not like you can do this on the down low, okay? You got to go back and you got to say, hey, judge, I want you to sign over. I want you to allow us to sign over to sell brother's life estate. And the judge says, well, what are you paying him for it? Uh, five bucks. Well, I ain't going to work. <laughs> not only will Medicaid be upset, the probate court's going to be upset too because that life estate has value. The judge understands that, okay? And he's going to say, no, you've got to pay him what it's, what it's worth. And guess what? Here's a table that the government was nice enough to print, make it very easy. You don't need expert witnesses. You don't need any of the rest of that stuff, all right? Just use the table. The answer is in the back of the book. So that's how that works. Now, you got to go to probate court, all the rest of this. But, but what if, what if instead of that, what if Big Sis, the one who wants to buy the thing, says, hey, I'm going to step up, okay? And there's no money, understand, there's no money left from brother's interest, disabled brother who, who owns the life estate, who would normally be the one expected to pay the taxes, utilities, upkeep, etc. There's no money there. He gets $60 a month for what? I don't know, whatever you can buy for 60 bucks a month in a skilled nursing facility, which isn't much, okay? That's all he's got. Who's going to pay taxes, utilities, upkeep? Well, sis wants to keep the house. She doesn't want to go to foreclosure sale. The remainder men, they might chip in. But I've got somebody who wants, oh, and by the way, I didn't mention, vacant house insurance is, are we over? Well, I'm going to have to get back to this at the beginning of the next hour. So you're listening to the David Carrier Show. I'm just getting to the good parts. Uh, <laughs> well, we'll cover this, like I say, in the first, uh, first segment next, uh, next hour. But um, it's not a cul-de-sac. There, there is a good way out of here that we've used repeatedly in the past. It'll work, but it takes a little following. So I hope you'll, uh, even though time keeps on slipping into the future, hope you'll meet me on the other side of the news. And uh, we'll get this thing wrapped up. You're listening to The David Carrier Show. I'm David Carrier, your family's personal attorney. Hello and welcome to The David Carrier Show. I'm David Carrier, your family's personal attorney. And you have found the place where we talk about estate planning, elder law, <clears throat> real estate, and business law. It's the uh, special Mother's Day edition of The David Carrier Show, which means that if you have a mother, then uh, it's free for you. You don't have to keep putting the nickels into the radio. <clears throat> no, no. You can even call for free. <clears throat> Instead of using the 900 number, just give us a call, 616-774-2424. That's area code 616-774-2424. We'll get your question, comment, or concern on the air. We've been working through a problem now since the last hour. I promised I'd wrap it up in the first segment. So, uh <laughs> So if you if you were expecting to hear my views on the abomination at the Supreme Court and the, uh, the hypocrisy and all the rest of this of the people who are you know uh, uh, you know the the people who who think that protest is insurrection or something and overthrowing the natural order of things well no you're not going to hear that uh, instead what we're going to talk about is a situation fairly common situation fairly common answer to a a, a situation that does arise 
And uh, it's just like the worst solution ever, except that it's been done so many, many times. Uh, and advised, attorneys advise clients to do this a lot, judging from the number of times I've seen it happen. So here's the idea. We've got a big family, a lot of kids, and one of the kids is disabled for some reason, not specified. Uh, the, the kid, the disabled kid, has a guardian appointed by probate court. Mom and dad have died. And the kid can live in the house. He has a life estate, a life estate in the house, which means that there's a deed out there that says disabled brother has a life estate. <clears throat> now, the question is, now that he's in a nursing home, what do we do? Apparently, he's on Medicaid, or at least they're thinking about it, because there's a in the question that they gave us, there is a... Uh, uh, it says, we also have concerns about potential, potential Medicaid recovery if the life estate is terminated while the life estate holder is still alive. Uh, so Medicaid is involved here. Now understand that you have to go back to probate court before you could sell this thing, before you could sell the house, and there's a sister who wants to buy it, uh, pay everybody off. Uh, but before she can buy it, it's got to be approved by the probate court. So you've got at least, the, with this kind of thing, you got a trip to probate court is part of the uh, is going to be part of the uh, the fun and, <laughs> and the attorney fees too. So, um, so the question is, what do we do? See, if you sell that, let's say brother's 70 years old. If he's 70 years old, right, then that life estate that he has, the ability to live in the house, right? Remember, mom and dad gave him a life estate. Well, there's value to that life estate. And at 70, what the state of Michigan says is that the value is right around 60% of the sale price. So if they sell it to sister, sister buys it for $100,000, right? Now they owe brother how much? Right, $60,000, 60%. Of 100000 60000 they got to, so all the rest of the kids, they have to split 40000 because that's what's left. Bet you didn't see that one coming. <laughs> okay, so that's the first problem. What's the second problem? So, you know, you got to get it approved, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Now, you could wait until, oh, the second problem is Medicaid wants the money. Medicaid says, oh, you got, when you had a homestead, which is what the life estate was, it was homestead. You can have that, right? You can have that, but what you can't have is cash. Now you have cash. We're out of here, says Medicaid. Come back and see us when you're broke again. Tell, come back and see us when you spent the 60000 in the ways that we approve of. And giving it to your brothers and sisters is nothing we're going to approve of, right? Come back and see us when the money's all gone. Are you with me on this? And it's not $60,000. It's, that's only if the price was one hundred. What if it was two hundred? Now it's 130000 What if it was a farm? It's half a million. Now it's 300000 Right, that brother has to get. Right, otherwise you do. You have medic. You have divestment penalties. A mess. You don't want that. But if brother dies now, his life estate vanishes, and you say, "Well, brother's not doing very well. He's developmentally disabled. He was in a car accident. He's got dementia. Whatever it is," and um, and that's that's what's going on. Okay. Now the question is, how can we get the house to sister now? without getting into all of this. And the answer is, if sister, oh, and by the way, we don't want the house empty. Empty houses burn. Everybody knows this. This is why uh, fire insurance on a vacant house is extremely expensive. So we want sister to move in. All right, we've got a caller on the line. When we get back from our call, we'll tell you what sister can do to preserve her interest in the property. Good morning, Rick. Welcome to the David Carrier Show. Thank you. How are you today? I'm just perking and working and having a ball, I'll tell you. Beautiful day outside. And Mother's Day, too. And it's Mother's Day, too. That's right. How can we help this morning? What, um, what uh, homeless seniors, what, do you, what can we do for them? Um, depends. Um, let's, assume, let's assume that when we're talking about homeless seniors that they have no assets. Right, if they meet the criteria, right? right um, what you'd want to do? See, part part of the problem with Medicaid is that you have to prove things, 
And the question is, if you're homeless, can we prove that you have no assets, right? I mean, that's a, that's a, that's a big deal. So what we would have to do is go to Department of Health and Human Services and put in a Medicaid. So are we talking about someone who has disabilities, someone who needs long-term care? Is that what we're talking about, Rick? Um, someone with a uh, heart failure, uh -huh. uh, borderline personality disorder, Okay. retired. Yeah. Uh, are they getting any Social Security? Is there anything like that going on? Yeah, Social Security. Okay. And Not so the, do they have one of those Lifeline accounts at the bank where the money gets in there once a week, or once a month, rather, and then they just go withdraw it? Is that how they're doing uh, it? They get Social Security direct uh -huh. deposit to uh, the Comac account, the Fish Standards, uh, uh, Social Security's direct deposit for yeah, yeah, and then a lot of a lot of the um, well, it's not just homeless people, but I mean a lot of older folks. What they were used to getting the check, they'd cash the check, and then you know just have cash for the rest of the month. Um, the problem with that is let me let me, let me ask you from a different way. Sure. It's uh, today. There's a a, a senior that is uh, living out of their car because uh, they are kind of maybe related to elder abuse. Okay. So, like, it's kind of like, say, like, what would a senior that's, like, just, uh, our point is that they're, they're living out of their car today and have no money. Right. And it's because of elder abuse, is that right? Well, uh, yeah. But then, they, in fact, yeah, it's been like two years, and they've went to the, you know, the, uh, the elder abuse hotline. Mm -hmm. It's known, but it's, I mean, it's kind of like, so I guess, it's coming from a different way. Yeah. It's like that, you know, like the hypothetical versus the reality. Mm-hmm. Well, here's the here's the reality. There are a lot of programs out there. Some are voluntary, like uh, Catholic Services Appeal, um, you know, that are religion type based. You know, down on uh, South Division, there's a lot of places. You know, there are a number of them. Um, you know that that'll that'll help out. Um, but also, the mm -hmm. state of Michigan through Adult Protective Services, and that's any police station you want to stop into, say, hey, I'd like to talk to someone from Adult Protective Services because I'm homeless because the kids stole my money, or somebody did, um, because there's laws against financial elder abuse, um, and they uh -huh. can get you into the system that way. Uh, I'm, not, I'm, just, I'm presently in the system. I guess my question is, is that today, I'm in Grand Rail, Michigan, uh, talking to you from my car with uh, 25 cents in my pocket, yeah. uh, you know, and I'm, I'm okay with that. And then I know, like, like I've seen your, uh, seen your neighbors. I'm, I'm aware of everything that you're probably going to mention. But I just kind of, like, say 211, like, uh, last night I called 211. Yeah. And, uh, and, and it's, you know, there's programs. But I guess, what, I guess the purpose of the call, probably, is the reality of, of you know, it's and it's the reality of you you that today okay you know like you know, and it's, I'm not you know I'm I will survive but it's kind of the educational side of things I guess it, I've uh, there's a Facebook page called Travels with Grandpa uh -huh. and and I think uh, in that page to be you know if anybody is interested in learning about reality. Okay. Follow that thing. Okay. And, and that's probably the best thing. Like, say, I know this and that, but like, say, uh, I'm, uh, and here is that I'm willing. So, uh, so Rick, they're, Rick, they're going to start playing the music here any, any second. Okay, so, we're good, we're good. All right, no, all right. So, so but, that's yeah, but what the, you're saying is Travels with Grandpa on Facebook, right? And that's a place uh, to find uh, out. Yeah. And, but you're, you already know about all the things I'm about. <laughs> 
<laughs> you already know everything I'm going to say. Right. So, okay, right. got it. Right. Got I'm it. kind of right. All right. Okay. All right. We'll stay in touch. Have a great day. Thank and you, Rick. You do a great job. All right. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye now. It's kind of a you know testimonial public service announcement from Rick there. Um, there are services available. Good news is he's aware of them. Um, you know, sometimes it is a little frustrating for the people in that community that uh, not more people take advantage of what's uh, of what's available. Um, oh, nope, here we go. You've been listening to the David Carrier Show. I'm up to. I'm David Carrier, your family's personal attorney. Welcome back to the David Carrier Show. I'm David Carrier, your family's personal attorney. And uh, if you're in the mood, you can give us a call at 616-774-2424. That's 616-774-2424. I swear to goodness, we are going to get through this. This is a situation where uh, mom and dad gave a life estate to a disabled child. Disabled child who's an adult, you know, Mom and dad have passed now. Everyone's grown up. Big family. All right, I'm just giving you the bare bones. And uh, no doubt on advice from somebody, they gave the disabled child a life estate with the idea that, well, if the disabled child has a life estate, then he'll always have some place to live, which is problematic at best because along with the life estate comes the uh, requirement of paying taxes, utilities, upkeep, all things that the disabled child cannot do. Um, especially if the disabled child winds up in a skilled nursing facility, uh, which is actually what has happened. The disabled child is now in a skilled nursing facility, and uh, uh, now what? You know, and now the kids, the brothers and sisters, would like to purchase the house. One of the would like to purchase and buy everyone else out. The problem with that is that the life estate has value, and the kid. The disabled child must be paid off. They must, they must buy his life estate, which is, until you're very old, a majority of the value of, uh, of the property. So if it's worth 100000 at age 70, at age 70, the life estate is worth about 60, a little more than 60% of the purchase price. So if you sell it for 100, you got to give disabled brother in nursing home $60,000. You do the math, you know, 60% of whatever you sell it for, okay? So the rest goes to the remainder men. Now, you might say, hey, brother's going to die in six months or a year or two years anyway. He's not going to live till he's 80. Uh, why can't we get it sooner? You know, it, that doesn't work, okay? You got to go buy what's in the table. In Bridges Eligibility Manual 400, Life Estate, Life Lease Factor Table, Exhibit two, all right? That's what you have to go by, okay? Simple as that. Now, what can we do? And I've been trying to, I've been driving on this. <laughs> Seems like most of the show. Here's the solution. We've got sister who wants to buy the property. She wants to move in. Great. Let's have sister do a caretaker agreement whereby she gets to move in, all right? She gets to move in, but we're not renting the property. It's a caretaker agreement. All right. It's a little bit different than a lease. But sister also agrees to pay taxes, utilities, upkeep, etc. Now, she's probably been doing that right along. So what we can do, what we could do, is in addition to that, we can put a lien, a lien against the house, right? Sort of like a home equity line of credit where sister is acting as the bank. So when sister pays the taxes, the utilities, the upkeep, all the things that need to be done anyway, right? They need to be done. Somebody's got to do them. Who, who wants to put up the money? Nobody. It's like the little red hen, you know, who'll help me grind the corn? Not I, said the, you know, who wants the bread? Oh, I'll have some, right? It's that situation. But, but you know, it's, it's not all bad for big sis. She wants the house eventually anyway. And if she doesn't do this, she's going to get a wreck. Or it's going to go to taxes, which happens a lot. You don't want that. Okay? So sis is willing to put up the money. Now, maybe she wants to move in now. And then we'd have to figure out, well, what's the value of you living there? You know, and uh, deduct that from the expenses that you've got. Maybe they even out. Okay? So sis doesn't get any spiff. Maybe she doesn't move in. 
and then the money that she pays, right, right, the money that she pays now, she gets paid back when the house sells, whether it's to her or to somebody else, okay? The point is that if we're smart about this, there are ways not to lose the house. There are ways to get sister taken care of and not give 60% of it to the state of Michigan or the nursing home or however you want to look at that, okay? Because right now, brother is on Medicaid. He will stay on Medicaid unless, unless you sell the house and then he gets his, if he's 70 years old, it's 60%. If he's 75, it's less. See, the older you get, the less is the percentage. That makes sense, doesn't it? Yeah, because it's based on the value of you living from whatever age you are to your life expectancy living in the house. It's a, it's a mathematical thing. The government tells you what it is. You don't need expert wit. I mean, back in the day, you'd have to get expert witnesses and do, you know, future projected future value and then regress it to present value. And it was a mess because you're, you're compounding all these what ifs, which you don't even know. Okay. Well, now the state does it for you. So <laughs> they do all the what ifs for you. It doesn't make it any more accurate. Right. It's not real in the sense that, oh, that's what it's going to be. No, and that's not the kind of reality we're looking for here. All we're looking for, what we're looking for, okay, is a number that the state will not argue with, that the Medicaid people will accept. That's all you're, that's what you're really looking for, okay, so that we can get the job done, so we can make sure that the house doesn't burn up because nobody put insurance on it. Oh, and by the way, in a situation like this, it is, almost universal, almost universal that the family keeps the homeowner's insurance that was on the house before, okay? People keep the homeowner's insurance, you know, mom and dad have died and you keep the homeowner's insurance going by paying, you keep paying the premiums, right? And because brother's still living in the house, you don't have to do anything, it's easy, right? No problem. But, but homeowner's insurance doesn't cover a vacant home. And so when the house burns down, whoops, not saying that it will, but if it does, that homeowner's insurance is worthless, not going to cover it. No, will not cover it, okay? So that's just one of the things that people get into. Every year, you know, they, every year they, they uh, uh, foreclose, the, the various taxing authorities foreclose on houses, and frequently this sort of situation is involved because no one's been paying the property taxes for three, four, five years, all right? And then they foreclose and you lose the house. Well, it doesn't have to be that way, right? There are ways to do it, but the life estate, you see, the life estate can be valuable, right? Uh, like Lady Bird Deeds can be valuable, right? They can be as part of a strategy, as part of a solution, but a life estate is not a solution. A Lady Bird Deed is not a solution. It's only gotta be part of it. You gotta understand Right? And the person that you're working with has got to understand what are the ramifications of it? What if? Um, talking to some folks on, on Friday, going through the what ifs. It can get confusing. It can get frustrating. That's true. But if you don't do it, then you wind up in a situation like this where you can lose everything. You don't want that either. You've been listening. Yeah, there you go. Welcome back to the David Carrier Show. I'm David Carrier, your family's personal attorney. We're going to try to knock out some of these uh, uh, questions that we've got here. Uh, this, <laughs> I like this one because it won't take 30 seconds. Um, oh, by the way, you can get your own question, comment, or concern on the air. Just give me a call, 616-774-2424. Uh, That's 616-774-2424. That's all you got to do. And since it's Mother's Day, it won't cost you one thin dime. How about that? Uh, oh, drop me an email. You can do that as well. David, David at davidcarrierlaw.com. It's just one David. David at davidcarrierlaw.com. And uh, that'll that'll work work well as well. Uh, here's, a, here's one. I want to add a person on my deed to house, but not transfer. I want my girl to live with me. But she wants her name on house, so so we can be together. <laughs> no, <laughs> 
What are you thinking? Uh, you know, what is she thinking? Well, you know, uh, obviously we don't want to interfere with uh, people's personal relationships, but, uh, you know, uh, uh, no way on God's green earth. How about that one? You know what I mean? I mean, people people get the idea that they can reverse these deeds. You, you see it. I mean, this is kind of in line with what we were talking about last time. When a deed is blunt force, right? A deed, it's a deed. You, you know, I mean, real estate deeds are deeds, but actions are deeds, right? You know, oh, you dirty deeds and done dirt cheap, right? So a deed is something that's been done, something that's been accomplished. And people think they can take it back. You can't take it back. You did it. When you give, when you, you know, you know, you want her to live with you. Well, there's a question mark right there. But, um, you know, okay, okay, let's assume that's the case. Um, do you really want to give up control of your house for the rest of your life um, um, to this person? You know, if you like it, why don't you put a ring on it? Okay, I mean, if that's if that's what's going on, um, because you know, you, you know what happens in cases like this. Not all the time. Sometimes true love, you know, Romeo and Juliet. Look it up. Sometimes that happens, but but you don't know how many other guys she's told the same thing to. You don't know how many other houses she's she's got an interest in, right? She doesn't have to pay the taxes. She doesn't have to pay the utilities. She doesn't have to move in with you. Okay. <laughs> Once her name's on the deed, on the deed, you know, all she has to do now is wait for you to die. And now she's got another house. What are you thinking? And, and what is this? She wants her name on the house so we can be together. What is this? Proof of your fealty, proof of your love or something like that? Well, get married if that's what, you know, that, that's what we did back in the day. You know, you want to be together? Want to take up housekeeping? right get married otherwise don't do that that's that's really that's really terrible terrible awful terrible don't do that okay what else we got um let's see we got some of these uh oh yeah here's a, here's a good one uh can i get in trouble if my grandma gives me money if her doctors say she has early stage dementia 20 years old, living, you know, whatever. Grandma's 87, pretty much, pretty much sound mind. She knows how to clean herself, wash dishes, basically take care of herself. She lives alone, rarely has trouble getting, rarely has trouble getting around the house. Remembers family names, who people are. Sometimes she repeats questions or things she said, but I think this is normal. Back in 17, she got a car wreck, won a settlement. Aha, uh -huh, here we go. Broke bones, collarbone. Sometimes she does have trouble walking. Since then, daughter has the idea, had the idea of POA of her, so it happened, and her attorney approved it. So fast forward, 2020, uh, Grandma helped me with a $20,000 car. Oh, that's nice, Grandma. Wrote the check and said yes. Also, she does ask if I ever need help with bills sometimes, and I do say yes because I do need the help. Her daughter is now saying she's taking that I'm taking advantage of her, which you probably are, Obviously, I mean, if you can get a $20,000 car and $15,000 worth of help with your bills just for asking, that's an advantage, it seems like. Um, uh, tell, and telling me I owe her the $15,000 in money she's given me. Grandma thinks she's a nut, that's the daughter, and says nothing will happen because it's her money. She has given me a lot of money, but who's in the right? She went to the doctor's, got a test. Doctor says she has early stage dementia. Well, right now we've got uh, Scott on the line, and we'll get to this one as soon as we're scot-free. Hello, Scott. Welcome to the David Carrier Show. Good morning, David. How are you this morning? I am just perking and working and having a ball, I'll tell you. It's a beautiful day. That is great. Plant some flowers um, today. I have uh, hopefully... <laughs> sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm maybe breaking up on you. I'm sorry about that. No, I got you. Loud um, clear. Okay. Okay. So the question I have is: Is a, a deed and joint tenants is a joint tenants deed always automatically rights of survivorship, or does it have to say rights of survivorship to have that benefit? So here's the thing: If either party, let's say you have a joint tenancy, 
So it says, you know, to this one and that one, A and B, joint tenants. If, um, if one of the parties acts in a way that's contrary to the joint tenancy, the joint tenancy is now defeated, is broken. So let's say it says joint tenants and you put your interest into a trust or you sell your interest or something else like that, something that's inconsistent with the joint tenancy. Well, now you revert to being tenants in common. So you own your half, the other person owns their half. But if you put joint tenancy with rights of survivor, right, now what you have is a life estate. You have the ability to occupy the property for your lifetime and what they call the possibility of reverter, which means that, see, with a, with a regular joint tenancy, if you've got a life estate, okay, and if you break it, right, mm -hmm. then it's not just a possibility of reverter. You can break that and say, no, I want my half, all right? I, I want to uh, be sure I get my half of the uh, future interest, the remainder interest, that's the joint tenancy. But with joint tenancy with rights rights of survivorship means that you have a life estate, you can live there now, and you have the possibility that you'll be the one who lives longest, right? And it all reverts back to you. So it's, they call it joint tenancy with a, with a life estate with a possibility of reverter. So if you want something where whoever lives the longest is definitely going to get it, you got to tack on with rights of survivorship. Some people just ignore it. It's like, oh, that doesn't really matter. It really does matter, okay? It really does matter that you put okay. with rights of survivorship. Can, can I ask a, a related, yeah, the, yeah, the back yeah. story is, um, the, the, the back story is uh, mom has three kids. Um, mom just passed away. Mm -hmm. One of the kids two years ago, unbe unbeknownst to the other kids, had his had mom add his name to the, deed of the home, and we believe it's just, we haven't looked at the deed, but we believe it's just joint tenants. It doesn't say right to survivorship. And the question is, is do the two children that didn't know anything about this, do, do they have anything, any leg to stand on to go after the brother so for here's, putting his name? Heaven? Yeah, yeah. So, here's, but, so here's the thing. So let's say they did that, joint tenants, and then brother deeded his interest into a trust, well, brother just cut himself off at the knees to the survivorship part. He owns half. Mom owns the other half. The other half goes through probate. And now the three kids have a one-third interest in the other half. Um, but when, if, if, if neither brother nor mom did anything like that, then uh, it all goes to brother. It all goes to brother, yeah. yeah. Okay. So... Even even if it doesn't say rights to survivorship, it's kind of implicit in it joint is, tenants. It is, unless that, somebody takes an action okay. contrary to the joint tenancy. Right, That's right, okay? right, right. Okay, no. All right. I appreciate the information. You have you have a great day. Thanks, Scott. Thank you. You're listening uh -huh. to the David Carrier Show. I'm David Carrier, your family's personal attorney. Not always good news. Welcome back to the David Carrier Show. I'm David Carrier, your family's personal attorney. We're wrapping up a um, one of our uh, email here, um, email thingies, where we've got the 20-year-old uh, who's hit up grandma now for about $35,000. His mom, who has power of attorney for, uh, for grandma, for her mother, objects to this and says that, uh, yeah, she bought you the car, but uh, that 15000 was a loan. Uh, grandma says, oh, no, it wasn't. And uh, uh, mom's unhappy, says she's taking advantage of uh, grandma. And grandma says, oh, she's a nut, and uh, I'm giving you the money. So um, the question is, you know, w w where do we come down on this? This is one of those situations where it's difficult, okay, because it's not the kid's money. You see, we've got grandma, we've got uh, mom. And we've got the kid, grandkid. And grandkid, grandma's giving money to grandkid, substantial amount of money, 35000 okay? Mom, ha grandma has trusted mom with the uh, power of attorney, okay? So there's some confidence there. There's some, hey, I might need some help. Also, there's been a diagnosis for early-stage dementia. So 
just because you've got a diagnosis doesn't mean um, that you're incapacitated. In fact, for an awful lot of folks, it's the diagnosis that gets them into the office the first time around, right? And in the email, they recite, yeah, he knows who she is, where she is, when she is, and she's basically taking care of herself. So here's the, here's the tension. And it's sort, of, it's sort of the question that we had from our caller, from Rick, where, uh, from Scott, rather, where, Rick and Scott, where um, uh, mom signed over the house to one of the kids, one of the three kids. Why did she do that? What was the idea? Like, who knows? Was mom competent? Was she not competent? Was her will, you know, overborne? Uh, was there undue influence? Again, who knows? We don't know. We don't know the answers to these questions. Um, but they're real que they are real uh, questions. And the thing is, if mom wanted to give the house to one kid, mom could certainly do that, okay? If mom, if grandma wants to give tens of thousands of dollars to one of her grandkids, we don't know how many there are, but to this one in particular, who may be nice and insinuating and, oh, oh, grandma, you're the best, you know, whatever, uh, she can do that. It's her money, okay? You know, this freedom, liberty, uh, land of the free, home of the brave. I mean, you get to do with your stuff what you want to do uh, with your stuff, even though other people may not like it. Very common. It happens routinely. People do things that other people don't like. Here's the other thing that happens is grandma, in a situation like this, um, uh, grandma may tell daughter things that are not true. Oh, I didn't give it to him just because she doesn't want to have the scene. Rather than saying, it's none of your business, get out of here, she went, oh, I don't know what you're talking about, or you know, something like that, and, which just creates more of a problem, okay? Same way with the uh, with deeding house over to one of the kids, and now that kid gets what's probably the main asset, typically, usually, frequently at least. The main asset in the estate is the house, right? And now it goes to one kid instead of three. What are the other three kids going to do about it? The answer is not much. See, if if you could litigate that kind of thing, if you could drag that sort of thing into court, oh my God, they'd be doing nothing else, which is why the courts are very sparing, very reluctant to get into. If I've got a deed that's notarized, that's got the names on it, that's got the correct signatures, the courts are very reluctant to get involved in those except in the most clear-cut cases of... Uh, undue influence, elder abuse, uh, you know, incapacity. The court doesn't want to deal with it. If there's some way to say, to affirm the deed, they're going to do it. Has, um, anyway, we've, uh, we've had cases like that, and you're, you're typically running into a brick wall uh, if you have a deed that has been done, that it met the requirements. Uh, very unusual for those things to get overturned, okay? So, it's a tension here. I'm not, I'm not trying to give you an easy, there is no easy answer to the thing. Um, the best bet though, and of course, maybe I would maybe think, oh, you, of course you're going to say that. But the best thing is to have the thing documented. You know, when you've got an attorney and you're in there, I mean, because certainly we have done many, many times things that our clients wanted us to do that the kids did not. And then the kids come back later and say, oh, mom never wanted that. Dad never wanted that. And it's like, well, here's why I think they did, <clears throat> because we documented the heck out of it. I mean, when we get a case like this, sometimes <laughs> we've done this, you know, where we're disinheriting people and whatnot, rather than have um, just, a, you know, one notary and no witnesses, and that's, you don't need witnesses. You know, we, we've had it where we got like three and four attorneys to be the witnesses, Okay, so we pull in, not just paralegals, you know, and very good people and all the rest, uh, but sometimes we'll even get, you know, multiple witnesses and we'll have the attorneys do it. Um, not that they're any better at observing or anything, but, you know, it, it, it kind of counts a little bit. So um, you got to be careful. See, when you do stuff, right, what you really want to do is be able to have the other kids convinced that this is what you really wanted. They may not like it, okay? Let's figure they don't like it. But if they're convinced that it's what you wanted, that'll go down a lot easier than if they think that brother or sister 
got over on you, okay? Which is why writing things on pieces of paper, all right? I mean, I already t I've told you the story several times already. You know, my dad, before he passed, he gave, and this was 10, 12 years ago, he wrote a little note about how I get the, the family map of Cape Cod that a friend of the family had done. Beautiful map, really cool. You know, everybody loves it. It's been in the house forever, right? And he wrote a little note saying I could have it. Well, then he tells me that he gave it to my brother John, which is fine. Johnny wants the map. He can have it. You know, I'll take a, I'll take a copy of it, right? But um, <laughs> I'm not getting into a fight over a map. Uh, a relationship much too important to me, you know, to worry about that kind of thing. But you can see how that happens, okay? Um, and, uh, you know, it's not as always as easy as making a, uh, you know, a digital copy of something and, you, ha you know, you have something that looks like it. So uh, very important when you're doing these things uh, to work it out and then document the heck out of it. Um, that's one of the functions that, uh, that we serve, you know, is to, um, it's very difficult for any beneficiary to come back on us and say they didn't understand, blah, blah, because of the process that we go through. That's so important. Been listening to The David Carrier Show. I'm David Carrier.